Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track here. It is now Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. Time for your hurricane outlook and discussion on vacation with the family. So, different background today. Uh, July, almost done. And, of course, it was a very impactful July. Way back at the beginning of the month with Hurricane Barrel. Since then, we haven't had anything to really speak of in the Atlantic Basin. The Eastern Pacific has also been generally quiet. But in the East Pack, that is getting ready to change. And while that is happening, while we have an active Eastern Pacific, I believe we will continue to see a rather inactive Atlantic. But that is just going to allow the sea surface temperatures to continue to be very warm. We're not having anything to stir everything up. And we're setting the stage for what is likely to be a very busy latter part of August through all of September, probably all of October, and into November. No reason to change our thoughts on any of that just because we've had a quiet several weeks now. July is typically a very quiet month. We see normally the highest pressures of the season in the deep tropics, although pressures have generally been running below average this year overall. But we do have that big Saharan air layer that's definitely an influence coming off of Africa. You're talking about a continent-sized area of warm mid-level air that just gets advected or moved horizontally out into the Atlantic Basin, and it really does literally put a blanket on things and keep us from running up the ace points and having to worry about hurricanes too much. There are seasons like 2005 and 2020 where it seemed like every couple of weeks we had something this year, it's obviously going to be a little bit different, and we're probably going to follow climatology pretty closely. Although, as we get into this, let me show you, Beryl certainly defied climatology. And let's not forget that. It had its origins way out here, south and west of the Cabo Verde Islands. This is where it was a trackable feature. Then it became a cyclone, tropical cyclone. The farthest east, I think, that we've ever seen it in records. Yes, I know, records didn't go back more reliably than... I don't know, even 80, 100 years ago, so you don't have to tell me. I know that. But Barrel continued along, of course, had devastating impacts in the Windward Islands, dodging around Jamaica, and uh, still brought some pretty rough conditions there. Heavy rain, gusty winds through the Cayman Islands with a landfall in parts of the Yucatan, and then, of course, the final landfall in Texas, where it was a literal disaster for the power grid. Let's move me over here now. There we go. Uh, with people being without power for more than a week, a very ill-prepared-for event, I think we can easily say that Barrel was one for the record books. I mean, clearly it was. It set all kinds of records very, very early in the season, showing us that wind conditions are favorable. And we'll have to go back and look and see why were they so favorable there at the end of June into early July, but they've been very unfavorable since then. And really, it's mainly all that dry-sinking air for the most part literally holding down the atmosphere, not allowing what we call upward motion, and then all that dry mid-level air, that doesn't help either. But Barrel, I still believe, was a harbinger of what is coming. There's no reason to believe that it won't be, and I think we're going to have a very active time of it, especially in the Western Caribbean this year, especially as we get into latter September and through parts of October. We'll deal with all that when we get there, though. It's what it looks like to me and all the other people that are really following this stuff closely we could all be wrong, and that would be great for coastal dwellers. Not so great for our reputations, but hey, we'll survive if that's what happens. But if it doesn't, and it is very, very active, we want you to be ready. And that's why I'm here, even on vacation, telling you what I know and what I'm looking at. I am enjoying the family time, though. It's not like I got my nose in the phone or on the iPad all day looking at the tropics. I peek in once in a while, and what I'm seeing, very active eastern Pacific coming up. Not so much with this system. But this one over here, Invest Area East Pacific, so EP94, forecast to develop from most of the model guidance into a formidable tropical system. And whether it becomes a major hurricane or not, we'll see about that. But it's going to head out in this general direction. How do I know that? Well, I don't know for sure, but most of the guidance, as we can see here, from the very awesome Tropical Tidbit site, just looking at the various models, these are the global plus the hurricane models, Dr. Cowan has made it very easy for us to just take a peek and see what's up. And we get a good idea of where something might be heading. So if you have interest in southwest Mexico or the Baja, clearly no real concerns for any direct impacts. 
the GFS and its ensembles fairly tightly clustered there. Let's use orange to kind of envelope everything around, or envelop it, whichever way you want to pronounce it. But that's right, that's how you look at it. You can kind of group it off and say, look, not a lot of members really straying outside this area that I have highlighted in orange. And so if you're in Cabo San Lucas or elsewhere along the Mexican coastline, even in the southwest United States, I saw that there was some speculation on the social media that this might come up and affect California, kind of like Hillary did last year. No, that is not going to happen. We are fairly confident of that in just looking at the guidance. All right. Looking at the big picture satellite animation, not a lot going on in the Atlantic Basin. There is our big tropical wave right here. Starting to get some more popcorn convection with it. On one hand, and i got to be careful because you start throwing other names out of past events and people get nervous. It reminds me a little bit of Bonnie, 1998, only, only because it took so long for the wave energy of Bonnie to come together. I remember tracking it and watching it in the early days of the available internet. We had different, I mean, we didn't have tropical tidbits back in 98. We didn't even have hurricanetrack.com back in 1998. That wouldn't happen until 1999, which, hey, it's our 25th year now, by the way. And if you didn't know that. But yeah, I remember tracking Bonnie and talking to a local television meteorologist in the Wilmington area, and he said, it's going to take time. There's a lot of dry air. And it's, you know, he said, watch for the popcorn thunderstorms. As that starts to go up, it'll gradually get into a more moist environment, the precursor to Bonnie it, it, that I'm talking about here, and it'll develop. And that's exactly what went on to happen. And he taught me a lot about how to watch for these kinds of things. So it's starting to percolate just a little bit. And it reminds me of Bonnie only just a little bit. Not that I think it's going to do what Bonnie did necessarily. Bonnie certainly wreaked havoc, havoc along the eastern North Carolina coastline way back in 1998. So it's interesting. It is starting to develop some thunderstorms with it, but they are very limited down here, as you can clearly see. But you can also see broad rotation with it. So there is energy. It is a tropical wave. It is approaching August. So we will monitor. And we'll talk about this more in a minute. This is 94E down in the eastern Pacific. Again, well on its way to developing as it heads out into this general direction. But look at what's waiting for it. You can just look at that and say, yep, the thermodynamic profile, not going to be very favorable, very long. So whatever this is going to do, it's going to have to do it in the next few days. And then it's going to run out of a favorable area in which to thrive. Moving out to the east, quite considerably to the east. Now this is interesting, much more energy now. The monsoon trough out here, tropical waves still rolling off. I want you to just remember, it is only July 30th. And while a lot of people are probably doing some hand-wringing, thinking, all right, these seasonal forecasts probably not going to bear out like they thought they were, it's only July the 30th. We have a long way to go. And the energy is there, really the only thing holding back the Atlantic right now. And this is very important to understand. When you've done this as long as I have and you know what to look for, once that cap basically in the blanket gets removed, there won't be much at all to stop these systems from developing. And we could have multiple tropical systems going at once. And some of the signs are there. I mean, we're seeing a very active pattern out here with this monsoon trough. The Atlantic, of course, is still very warm. Tropical waves are still rolling off. We're just seeing the impediment of that very dry mid-level air. But the calendar and climatology tells us we still have a couple of weeks plus until we start to expect things to change. And then if they don't, yeah, we'll start re-examining the whole idea of this being a very busy hurricane season. And then we have to ask ourselves, what's going to happen with all that extra available energy? But we're not there yet. We have to wait and see. Not that anybody's hoping for hurricanes, but if we're told there's going to be a very busy hurricane season and it doesn't happen, that leads to a lot of problems, obviously. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. You want the forecast to be believable, but you don't want them to come to fruition and people's lives are changed. So it's a very odd business to be in. I think you would agree. All right. So looking at our tropical waves, 94E, and our system not designated an invest area yet that I'm aware of. There it is there, so a large envelope of energy. Some yellows and greens in there, so some relative or cyclonic vorticity as we call it. Look at the energy that comes off of Columbia here and then streams out into the southeastern Pacific. That's fascinating to me, pretty cool to see. 
And sometimes that'll interact with a tropical wave coming through or get involved with a passing Kelvin wave and it all can just curl up and then you're off to the races with a tropical system. Lots of ways to get to the genesis point of these tropical cyclones. There though is the uh, area of vorticity or energy trying to coalesce south of the Mexican coastline and once this does get going and move off in to this direction you know I'm going to show it to you and just show you hey this is what I look for and you can clearly see this does not look like that and until that happens with our feature over here I am not too concerned about it. So let's see what the models are saying for uh, our Atlantic system. We already know sort of the end game if you will for what's going to happen with 94E over here so I'm not ignoring it on purpose but I showed you some of the model guidance off of that current storms page just a few minutes ago so we'll leave that alone but let's watch over here in the Atlantic Basin and um, let's see why did it do that I don't know oh, the search bar came up there's the energy right there and it's not much that's the vorticity that we look at here in the modeling and as I move this out through time just kind of watch what happens. It moves along. This is from the Euro. Oh, I know what I did. I switched to the, the wrong frickin'. I, I, t I clicked on the Euro. See, I, I, I got to just slow down. So let's start over, shall we, with the models part here. There's a GFS. There's our tropical wave. And um, it is not very energized, as you can see. But it's kind of neat because you can just follow these flags in here, the wind barbs. And there's a little bit of a curvature in there. Even in the height lines, you can see that. So there's our tropical wave represented at the 5,000 foot level. Now let's move it out into time. It comes through, and all that yellow that you see moving through the Virgin Islands and the Northeast Caribbean as a whole, eventually impacting Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and elsewhere, just generally through this corridor right through here, well, that's going to bring some rain. And rain is an impact, especially if it's heavy. So you might need, as they call it, the tank rain down there. So that could be coming, going back and forth here. Let's see where this ends up. We're out at about four or five days into time. Our system does get into the southeastern gulf, at least according to the GFS. And you can see this big ridge here outlined very easily. I'm just kind of extrapolating it out until the reaches off of the map there, but a pretty strong western Atlantic ridge. The Bermuda High, there's Bermuda right there. So it stands to reason that this weaker system would just come around the periphery and end up in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, where it tries at about day six to maybe come together near Apalachee uh, Bay and vicinity. And yeah, we'll see about that, the, uh, the Big Bend of Florida area. And then, oh, maybe it moves on farther out. But now we're eight days out. So let's just see what happens over the next let's say five days all right let's just take this back to day five does this end up as a big rainmaker across parts of florida and the southeast gulf or and now we can go over to our friend the euro and let's back it up a little bit or does this as the euro shows and again we're watching about right down here there's our wave energy so this is every 24 hours don't have the full euro in just yet so there's tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, Friday, so that's day three, day four, day five. So if you compare the two, the Euro at day five versus the GFS at day five, a fairly notable difference. The Euro is more concentrated on the east side of Florida, whereas clearly the GFS is less concentrated and whatever energy is there is on the southwest side of Florida. Why the difference? Well, it's all dependent on which model handles the energy and the upper pattern and the placement of all the chess pieces the best. But again, this is still five days out. And while the modeling is pretty good, even at 120 hours, we just don't know for sure. You know, we have to watch and just kind of see what happens in real time. The Euro goes on day five. There, there's day six, seven, and uh, I would just leave it at day seven, a formidable tropical cyclone between Bermuda and Hatteras. So if that were to come to pass verbatim, we would get a named storm out of this that looks like a well-developed tropical storm in the model, and the name, of course, would be Debbie. But remember, the GFS at day seven, a very, very different story. And you can see I left the circle up there for where the Euro has it. GFS is easily, I don't know, that's got to be a thousand miles away, right? 
So yeah, some discrepancies in the models on intensity and placement, and this of course gets us into the first few days of the month of August. So while July looks like it'll generally end on a quiet note in the Atlantic Basin with just something trying to percolate out there, the East Pacific looks to dominate with probably two different systems developing, but a huge, huge emphasis on none of these systems look like they're going to impact Mexico, and none of them appear that they're going to go up towards the Baja or the Southwest United States, so really no worries about that. And if that were to change, of course, we'll be on top of it. And I, among many other sources out there, will certainly let you know. All right? All right, well, that is it from me for today. Let me get this wrapped up and online for you. As always, I appreciate you watching. From all of us at the Hurricane Track family, we appreciate you too. I am Mark Suddeth. I will see you again sometime tomorrow.